Griffith Gibson Ramsey Productions is the best little jingle house in the West. Tonight I talk with the two Bryans about where it all started. Also, I get to profile the little known origins of Bruce Allen's rock empire. But now world-class high jumper Debbie Brill, who made history as the first woman in North America to clear six feet. Debbie Brill has been called many things, headstrong, provocative, inflammatory, and outrageous, but never dull or boring. Growing up in rural BC, Debbie and her sister Connie loved to jump so much that their father built them a high jump pit in the backyard. In her book, Jump, Debbie tells how she and Connie spent long hours there perfecting their styles. Debbie's is known as the Brill Bend. It led to her first big win in 1970 when she broke the Canadian record and her career took off like a rocket. I asked how she managed to handle so much media attention at the tender age of 17. <laughs> it was very strange. It was, it was, it felt, uh, it felt kind of like I was a person looking at all this stuff winging by me, you know. I was just like, stuff happened and, and nothing seemed to relate. There was all kinds of life rushing around and by me and 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 it sort of it, it all involved me but I kept I sort of felt like I was on the outside there looking at it and none of it connected anywhere is that what finally made you drop out for a couple of years do oh you yeah think? oh yeah just finally saying this is nuts people should not live like this this is very unhealthy I have to figure out who I am and then I can maybe put myself back in here so that it doesn't have a hold of me uh, it becomes a part of me. Debbie, you had a real independent streak that I assume must have come from your father. What were your parents like? I guess I, I was raised, all of us were raised as people first. Um, I wasn't raised like a girl, I was raised like a person. I could be anything. And girl was second to that. So, and also with a belief that it's what you are inside that matters it's not what you do out there so there was never any pressure for me to be this great high jumper or to do anything really really well other than be a, a good person and that was always reinforced an independent strong person was always reinforced uh, they didn't when I quit the whole family thought that that was they understood why I did that there was never any pressure your whole story is fascinating how did the Olympics the 72 Olympics at Munich affect your life it certainly colored my whole view of the Olympics ever since. You tend to, again when you're young, you tend to go in with sort of a, when you haven't been somewhere, you, you, you sort of think of it in all of the um, most positive, all of, all of your ideals come out, your, the idealism of what the Olympics should be, and, and this is where I'm going, I, I know what it should be, and, and this is going to be great. Um, it's really hard to be slapped in the face with something that is, it was not even close to that. It was, I think Munich was the first of the really mega Olympics where the amount of money that went into all of the things outside of the sport was astounding. And then to see the politics piled on top of that, um, it was, it, it, I really didn't like it, <laughs> I thought. This is really awful. It's been completely sold. It's been sold, and it's become business and politics. And then that, of course, came home in, in a terrible way when the Israelis were all killed and that whole situation happened. So ever since then, certainly my attitudes have been colored by that. I just, I, uh, the Olympics is a, a business, a, a big political money machine. I think now I can accept that that's what it is and say it's not, it's not the best way to do sport, I don't think. It's something almost separate from sport now. It's like a, uh, an expo, that kind of a thing. It has that kind of momentum to it. Are you now one of the oldest women in the, field, in the, uh, in the sport? Mm-hmm. I'm sure I am. How does that make you feel? Um, I still love doing it. It doesn't, I don't. I know that it's sort of like walking into new territory. It was like when I had Neil, it was like walking into new territory. There really had never been any women who had had kids and come right back in and, and right back into international competition. So it was like, oh, and I was very nervous because it was like, oh, I don't know, can, can you do this? Will it work? I think it will, but will it? And uh, that was like, that was sort of uncharted territory, and so is this. It's like, 
everybody, a lot of people have the, the feeling that, okay, when you have kids, you're supposed to quit. Well, as you, you reach a certain age, and this has been ongoing, of course, through every year. Well, you know, Debbie, you're just not going to be able to be as good now. I don't believe it, so I'm just going to keep going. I don't think I'll ever quit. I've actually realized that. I, will, I think after this year, I won't tr try to um, compete at the same level, but I'll always high jump. I love doing it. They are Brian Griffith and Brian Gibson, the nucleus of one of the Jingle World's most creative companies. Along with Miles Ramsey, they're Griffith Gibson Ramsey Productions, winning countless awards for their radio and television commercials. However, in the beginning, they were singers in groups like the Accents and the Numerality Singers. At CBC, they sang and they marched, they danced and clowned their way through show after show, season after season. Which came first, the Numerality Singers, the Accents, the group? Okay, chronologically, I, I guess the Accents... Uh, were a what? Were, that was a four-voice uh, four group, yeah. three guys, Griff, myself, a fellow named Bob Hamper, his yeah. trombone player in Toronto, and Lynn McNeil. And we did some TV. That's what, that was our first television work, I think, with CBC. Uh, from the uh, accents came the Numerality Singers, yeah. which went from four to nine. Yes. That group took us into some national television with the Craft Show of the Week. Ooh, remember those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did. We were featured on one, as a matter of fact. Numerality. Hey. With the uh, the Let's Go Show and stuff like that, learned an awful lot about pop music yeah. uh, all of a sudden because our, our roots had been in jazz and I, I just and then we went on the road and did the lounge circuit so it was a lot of but we really got our teeth cut on the pop music the Beatles and everything because we had to actually you know cover all of those songs and records on the on the show what is the silliest thing you ever did for money I think the chorus gentleman show which is what what we were, it was like a, a Mitch Miller type show where you're singing a lot of old army songs and, and, and doing uh, student prints drinking songs and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't, it was, I don't recall it getting any sense. No, it didn't. That. It, it was all the formation <laughs> marching and so on. It was fun. Was a Hannah Swell Cabaretta. <laughs> While whining and dining, I met her. He met her. We drank one or two. Folks do. The night was wet, but she was wetter. It was literally a full-time living to be made as a group singer, as a writer, and, and then that stopped. I suppose budgets mm -hmm. dried up, and, and, and I mean, people have no musicians and singers have no idea how great, it, how easy it, it was, given that the talent was there. Being group singers to start with was a natural lead into singing jingles, mm -hmm. because yeah. in those days. All jingles were sung with about four or five singers, a couple of girls and a, and a couple, few guys, and, and uh, it was a natural, it was the kind of harmonies that we were, we were already doing, so it was a, a very natural. And, and, and since then, of course, uh, you know, jingles uh, are a little closer emulated to pop music and, sure. and the different yeah. sounds. The idea was to, well, what about jingles? And, and there was nothing being done here, and so we went to Seattle. I think actually Griff made the connection and did a, an account called Riceroni. Uh, it actually turned out to be a, a, a bogus a deal because the guy didn't have the account and we spent our life savings. And I didn't get paid. And Griff didn't get paid. It was uh, but it, 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 a humble beginning. It was <laughs> our first ad uh, reel, as they, it, our yeah. sample reel, and included this San, uh, Riceroni, the San Francisco treat, you know, an ageless jingle. And so we took that around to various agencies who would ask us, you guys did that? <laughs> that sure. And we say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we did that. We, so why not? We did that. So it's sort of an instant credibility. But we were strangers in our own city here yeah. for, for yeah. years yeah. Uh, until uh, they discovered, hey, we can do it like they can do it in LA, Toronto, and so on. These were pretty good times for you. I mean, they're great memories for you. Well, I mean, the idea to start with, when you go back, anyone involved in music or got involved in music in high school and thought that they would actually be making a living or doing something and earning money that you, you'd kill to do in the first place is, you, you, gotta, you gotta love it. You well, just, yeah, I mean, exactly. you, you had to pinch yourself every once in a while and all of a sudden here you are in a, you know, a little bit of limelight, if uh, you call it that. And uh, no, it was really fun, a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, 
Debbie's heading off at the ripe old age of 35 to the Summer Olympics in Seoul. Griffin Gibson Ramsey Productions continues to create hummable commercials like Share the Flame, Supernatural BC, Lotto 649, and many more.